Does everyone know uh, what railroading is? Does anyone does oh, everyone yeah. know what railroading is? Yeah. I've been taken to the train station a couple times. Yeah. So the, the thing that you want within the structure planning is you don't want to be too much of a railroad DM, and you don't want to be too much of a to get yourself into an improv situation, right? You want to do something that I call the breadcrumb situation, where you're giving your players the freedom to be in a world that's a semi-open world, but if you have a story that you really are invested in from a macro style, you're giving them breadcrumbs uh, along the way. Uh, again, everyone's different. I'm going to say this right now. There is no such thing as a wrong DM style, right? For the, depending on the players you're playing with. In my case, most of my players value role play. All right, they don't really like combat. They don't like simulating combat that much. So, for me, it's much more important to breadcrumb. For other people, it might be less. Uh, but in general, when we talk about railroading, what we're talking about is, let's say that he's a paladin, he's a rogue, and they want to go save the princess and he wants treasure and he wants the princess, right? And I'm saying, no, you're not gonna do that. I say that in the middle of the game, I'm like, fuck that. You're gonna do this, right? That's railroad. When you as a DM actively go out of your way to like 960 degrees, change that path that they've already declared they wanna do, you are railroading. So anytime that you're toxically or kind of aggressively changing the story, that's railroading. Because like some people think railroading is just like even telling the character like nudging them away. No, nudges are not railroading. It's legitimately taking the, the story and going like this. So there is that. But the other one is, let's say that they want to do that thing and I don't even know what to do. And I just let them go to the bar and have a bar fight. That makes no sense. Why would that help them get the princess, right? Or in this case, the prince. Let's go with that, just to change gender norms. Uh, so they're trying to, to save the prince, uh, and I tell them they, I don't give them any direction how to do that. They just go to the to the thing. So really, what you're what you want to do as a DM is you want to develop the thought process of how could this be a contingent story and storyboard the story, but let them kind of get through that story the way they need to. So they're telling you're just a storyteller. That's the, the biggest thing I can give you as advice. You're a storyteller, but they're the people that's actually creating the plot, right? So you have a world. Uh, I do recommend a system called Microscope. Does anyone hear what Microscope is? Has anyone heard of that? Okay. I was just, this is going to give you some more specific advice. So Microscope is actually a world building micro RPG. I'm not kidding. And what it allows you to do is storyboard with your players, or even if you don't want your players to know anything about the world, another group of friends that you trust, right? And it allows you to create epochs. So you have three epochs. One time when we did a microscope, I kid you not, we created a world of rats and mice. No humans existed. Magic didn't exist. No metal was allowed. And they had the rats <laughs> created uh, machines from wood, and the mice created machines from plants that they grew. And then what we also did was there was a rad rapping raptor Jesus, uh, because dinosaurs were genetically brought back to Earth. And so the carnivores were with the mice, and the uh, omnivores were with the, uh, with the rats. And this was a whole world that we created together. And then we rolled it. And it was one of the greatest times we ever had. Is that uh, Orcus, or? What? Is that Orcus? No, it's Microscope. Josh, I will interrupt you for a moment. Uh, we do have Alon from Goblins awesome. and Growlers. Uh, awesome, he's here. Is willing. He, he is not our presenter. No. Uh, he's with Goblins and Growlers, but he is willing to help with some uh, questions and give additional input. Awesome. Here's the quick heads up. So I know this is a DMing 101 panel. I know that uh, I've been DMing since at least 701. So 7th um, edition, pretty advanced, but I can bring it back to 1st edition, DM 101. Uh, my name is Alon. This is not my panel, but I really want everybody here to have an amazing uh, DM 101 panel. I run a bunch of them at, at other... I'm with Goblins and Growlers, the professional uh, DM group here. We uh, operate in Richmond, Virginia. We're called Goblins and Growlers because we mostly play at breweries, uh, where if the adventures are bad, the beer's at least good, and if the adventure's really good, then the adventures eventually get good, and it's a kind of a self-fulfilling cycle. Uh, I also have um, a podcast uh, called Quid Pro Roll. That's really, really fun. Uh, our DM, Alex, she is one of the greatest DMs ever. She's going to be here for our 2.30 panel along with Posh. If anybody went to Who's Role, they're good friends of ours. Um, we're going to be at the 2.30 panel, which is going to be a Q&A panel. So if you have some questions about, um, especially from this panel, about uh, your specific games or how you can be de better DMs, we'll be able to answer those at 2.30 in here. Uh, but I wanted to give you some quick 
DM101 tips, since that's why you guys are here. Uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to ask who here has DM'd before? Not necessarily Dungeons and Dragons, but just any sort of role playing. This is, oh my gosh, look at this. Beautiful, awesome. You're in the right place. Who has never DM'd? It's honestly, it's pretty close to 50 50, which is awesome. So, uh, good news for you guys uh, who have never DM'd. If you would like to DM, we're going to go over some of that stuff. If you have DM'd before, hopefully, a lot of this is helpful to you. Some of it, I think, is going to be some things that you've heard before, especially if you were at our Thursday panel for 2 30, where we're talking about best practices. But one of the quick things I want to talk about if you're DMing, you're, you're getting into it. Uh, the, the hardest thing you're going to run into, besides learning the system, which sometimes is, is one of those where I'm of mixed, there's two camps. There's the you need to know all the rules so when your players try to challenge you on them, you know when to smite them down as God and when to say, no, 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 it's okay. You, yeah, you're doing the right thing. You can shoot that arrow out of the sky with your arrow. Is, uh, is, uh, there's, there's two camps there. I'm going to tell you there's no right way. If you want to just jump into DM and you don't want to know all the rules, a really good thing to have on your side is I like to call a rules lawyer. Uh, if you have a player who really knows the rules well, uh, talk to them beforehand. Say, hey, like you want to DM and want to play an adventure. I don't know rules, but love to tell stories. Uh, if you could help me out whenever a rules thing comes up, get them on your side early, because if you don't get them on your side early, they'll use all those rules against you. Uh, but. But if you do get them on your side early, they can really help you to regulate your games. Um, for those of you who, who look at the textbooks and like I do, unlike some of my fellow DMs, I look at them and I'm like, that's a lot of words. This is why I dropped out of school. Uh, <laughs> actually, on that note, one of the best things you can do as a DM is actually create allies in general. So role, rules lawyer is like a, is a, a subtype. Another one would be even like a quartermaster is another one that I've seen people use. Get mm -hmm. your players involved in the task. You as a mm -hmm. DM do not do need to do everything. Oh, please don't. In fact, make it easier. Everyone needs a DM. I know in this room it seems like there's tons of DMs for players. There's not. Everyone needs a DM. So be sure to, to lean into the things that you love to do because as a DM you should never hate DMing. If you're ever at a point where you're like, I'm not having fun. You're not in a good place. You need to talk to your players. Um, but lean into the things you love to do and the things that you're not super keen on, find people to help you out with them. Um, battle masters, like you don't like initiative tracking, battle masters are good. The, the most important one is this. I never take notes. Never. Never. I run seven concurrent D&D games, well, uh, a different type of role-playing stories right now. For me to remember what's going on in any of those stories at any given point in time is a complete, people stop me in the road, they're like, hey, listen to the podcast, I'm like, so much thank you. And they're like, what do you think about this thing? I'm like, I don't even know what we're talking about. Oopa, happy new year, everyone, happy new year. That was a, that was a one, that was a one, we rolled a one. We rolled a one, uh, yeah. Please. Yes. Yes. I'm going to repeat this, so don't worry if you can't hear. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, here's my 101 tip. His question, or not question, it's a comment. It's something that everybody should know. Rules lawyers or trying to look up the rules can really break up the story or really break up the period of play. You can have this epic adventure. Stones are falling all around you. It's an obvious ambush. You guys walked into this canyon thinking that there was a shiny coin on the floor, and there is. But lo and behold, it was a trap the whole time. Uh, the stones have come to the back end and the front end of the canyon. You're in the middle. All these archers come out, they sh aim their bows at you and they fire. Okay, I want to take my bow and I want to shoot that arrow out of the air. Well, wait, well, how, I guess we have to look up the mechanic. Okay, give me a second. Let me look up. I guess you get bathroom breaks and stuff. That really breaks up. You had such a great narrative going. Everybody was engaged and then all of a sudden, the best thing to do as a DM uh, is to kind of say, Here's how we're going to rule this now. I don't know if there's rules for this, or maybe you do and you just can't remember. And you say, we're going to rule this where I'm going to make you roll a charisma check to talk this arrow into hitting that other arrow. <laughs> it, ma it makes the most sense for me. I'm the DM, so please let me have this one. And then we'll look it up afterwards and we'll see how it actually r rolls or how it actually operates. 
<laughs> oh my god, every character is a bard. Um, so, so uh, really great. We'll, we'll get to some questions. I know this isn't my panel, so we'll get to some questions. Right, we'll get to say or Josh's uh, or Josh's point, panel. We'll we'll give a round of nobody's panel, but we appreciate you coming in and helping. Yeah. Less than 10 minutes out? Okay, so I have to cram in everything he's going to talk about, so he has to repeat himself. For if this was a college class, you all would be able to leave and not be counted against. Yeah. Uh, you are more but than welcome But it's not, so we will count it against you if you leave. So here, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, some, uh, I, I know there's questions. We'll, we'll, I'll let the real panelist, when he gets here, uh, run the panel how he's going to run it. Um, I, one other, where we're t while we're talking basic 101 DM things, uh, probably the best piece of advice is somebody, I've been DMing I think now for 18 years, professionally for like eight or nine. Um, I have been very lucky because I've, I, one, I'm, I make money doing this, which is crazy. Uh, two, I raise a ton of money for charity, which is the best. Uh, the reason why I'm able to do this is because D&D, &D, as, as was being highlighted on earlier, has become an inclusive space. When we built Goblins and Growlers, we built it as a, um, we are going to create an inclusive space in tabletop gaming. At that time, even as a DM for however long I'd been, I'd walk into game stores and sometimes people would be like, hey, prove you should be here. And I'm like, are you, look at what I'm wearing. God damn. Um, right? Uh, but uh, in, that was really difficult. Uh, 5e and some other systems, uh, uh, tons of other systems do it even better than 5e, but have started to cre uh, have tons of varieties of writers have created these spaces in the tabletop where we can acknowledge and we can create that where we are, which is why um, for Goblins and Growlers we have uh, all sorts of DMs from every which place because we reached out and we said, hey, we want to create this space and everybody created it with us. I'm part of the LGBTQ community. For those of you who are here, hey. Uh, and uh, more and more of us are, are creating these spaces where I've been able to run games for uh, trans kids who want to play the, um, who, how they identify as people. Uh, and want to do it in a safe space, and D&D &D has become a safe space for them to experiment with who, or, or to be who they are and, and be confident with it so they can bring it out into society. Now this is a big overarching antecedent for what I want to talk about for DM 101, which is please, um, not everyone's going to have, have like, I, I don't know much about disability. I don't. I don't have too many friends who, who have been able to confide in with me on it, but I've talked to them about it because uh, I want to learn more because I always want to create an inclusive space on that. I'm obviously not a person of color. I am an immigrant. Um, that gives me a unique perspective. I'm not a person of color. Having those DMs, having those friends where you can say, hey, like, come, play at my table. Let's figure out how we can create an inclusive space on every game that we play. Um, it, you're not always going to be perfect. You're always going to be learning. But I think as, as people here who want to DM, you have a unique opportunity to continue to build this inclusive space that we've already spent so much time curating and so that we continue to grow and continue to uh, kind of be like a little bit of a, like we were talking about earlier, a little bit of a cultural phenom that's going on right now. Um, we, all, we all have a lot of power in this room. So I know that that's like a high topic. It's eventually it's something I always talk about in my DM 101 things though because um, it used to be really toxic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it used yeah, to be. You guys, everyone here, by being here, you are, are all part of the solution and doing amazing things to create inclusive spaces for gaming. And I, first off, please give yourselves a round of applause. I really appreciate all of you for, for seeking, seeking out how you can create these spaces. And, uh, and then second off, just uh, you know, continue to DM with, with those things in mind. That doesn't mean that you highlight uh, a character by being like, uh, you know, uh, for me, when I introduce immigrant characters, they're just characters who happen to, you know, be, have immigrated and actually, stuff. But that actually segues into a really good topic, but before that... That's probably more advanced DM 101. There is. You can just, at goblinsgrowlers.com and Goblins and Growlers on everything else. Um, oh, and, but we'll, we'll get to that later. I don't want to promote myself at not my panel. <laughs> it uh, feels really weird. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing I would say that like really helps with inclusion, uh, from from my perspective as both a POC and as someone with autism spectrum disorder, uh, is so called, something called session zero. Yeah. Uh, Huge. I, I know he's going to get into it, so I haven't gotten into it yet because I'm still holding out hope that he's. Uh, I don't think so. Well, no. 30. I think we can just take this over. Yeah. Oh, this is ours now. This Revolution. is right. Um, so the. 
Yeah, I, I think a lot of you who have been to a lot of panels, you've been hearing more and more about session zero. It's something that's very important. Why session zero is so important as professional DMs? I literally don't do, I shouldn't say, I don't, I do games at breweries and I don't hold session zeros then because then it's really free to play, but um, you, I hold a session zero game for any long standing adventure I'm going to run. Here's the reasons why. Uh, these are quick top level. Here you can see my bullet points here. Just improv with me. It's perfect. Uh, the reasons why I host my session zero. Whoop, whoop, uh, one, this guy right here. Uh, gotta, uh, no, uh, my, my, my reasons are, um, one, I can tell the players what they're going to get into if you're, if you're playing with me. I uh, have an improv comedy background. Uh, I am so all about, if you tell me, if you make a convincing argument that you want to talk this arrow into hitting another arrow, I'm the most likely DM to be like, hell yeah, let's make that happen. Uh, that's hilarious, and I would rather have that happen than, uh, I, I don't know, you just try to flex the arrow. No, I'm, also that would be great. Uh, you, so. People who, uh, I have a lot of friends who play survivalist games and even some survivalist D&D &D games, which are awesome. They do crafting. They have these, I, I'm never going to tell you your inventory. I don't even track people's gold. I'm like, if you want to buy something, like, you just talk me into selling it to you and, <laughs> and I'll revoke it later if it breaks my game. Uh, um, but I'm super loose with that. That does not line up with all players. You, as a player, have expectations and power to find the game that you want. There's a lot of different platforms to find it, whether that's uh, at your house, at a rando's house, uh, at a game store, or uh, at a brewery if you're in Richmond, um, or, uh, or online, uh, not just with Roll20, but Twitch is becoming like a really viable platform to play because they, they've just really improved their streaming. A very viable platform to play um, to play D&D &D games on, which is amazing because even if you live out in the middle of nowhere, which I have before and been like, God, there's no D&D &D out here, uh, I could jump onto Roll20 and then have uh, latency issues and, and cast spells like two rounds of initiative late. Um, That's why but, typing's so great. Right, <laughs> but it's, it's gotten a lot better. Uh, so you as players have the power to find the DMs that work for you. Have that session zero, make sure that what they want is what you want and what you want is what they want. The other thing you can do with it and this is the really fun one. This is the DM 101 storytelling that you all came here for, top secret information, is that you get to talk about not just your character's story, but your character's goals, your character's missions. If you're playing, I'm, here's my favorite, I haven't played this on my friend's podcast yet, but I'm guessing with this character, it's a, um, it's a uh, warlock who was grani, and he couldn't get any of the demons to sponsor him to be a warlock, so he crowdfunded minor demons. So he has like, <laughs> he has like 23 patrons, and before he casts a spell, he has to thank them all, and that's like my first round of initiative every turn, is thanking my patrons before I can, they give me enough power. So uh, my goal with that uh, character, which I talked to the DM about, even though it was kind of one shoddy, we're hoping to have a longer podcast for it, is for him to uh, earn his way up to where he has like hundreds of patrons and then he has to struggle with like, okay, how much of myself is me for real and how much am I giving to my patrons and have this existential like uh, <laughs> moral quandary where he's evaluating where he's at and where, where how he, how he uh, the minor demons that keep coming up to sponsor him, how much of himself he has to give to continue to be a powerful warlock. Um, yeah, it's great. Oh, man. But so my point being, I've had this conversation with him. If I just introduced this character to his game, first off, I think he would have said, what the funk? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what but this PG-13 panel. Uh, but uh, first off, I think he would have said that. Second off, he would have no idea what goals I want to do with that. What do you do with this? Uh, you set those beforehand, and he's like, you know what? I can really write some cool stuff that I wasn't planning on writing for my adventure, but really fits in really well. Now, if you have, this goes in so many ways. I had a character who's, I love characters with flaws, if you couldn't tell by me already telling a character. I had a character in one of my campaigns. He, this is another great antecedent that hopefully helps you guys. He was a pyro. He was starting out as a pyro. He was a sorcerer, wild magic, but he loved just lighting things on fire. Uh, it was great because whenever I knew I needed to move the adventure along was when he was just lighting something on fire in the bar. Uh, and, uh, but one of the things he wanted to do was he wanted to have this um, character development arc where his pyromancy got him in trouble 
trouble in a way that wasn't just like him getting in trouble like the slap on the wrist, but in a way that actually hurt his party, which was also close to his character, so that he would learn and grow and have this awesome um, uh, uh, come to pyromancy moment where he would, uh, where he would, where he would uh, forsake uh, his quest to uh, fulfill his fire uh, god father uh, to try to catch the young airbending boy and move on to be his own person. I kept making fun of him that he was just, he was just being that, uh, being, what was the name of that character? Everybody all at once? Yeah. I was just making fun of him. I was like, you're just Zuko. And he just was like, no, it's my own it's OC, 2018. Don't cut steel. Yeah, um, nothing is original. You'll right. find that out quickly. It's Actually, just quickly, uh, uh, if you want to commit to this panel, could you like come to the side? Could the people on the sides kind of come down here so we're just not blocking uh, the, the the door? The door. Um, if we have fire, I just learned this today. Fire code, by the way, is uh -huh. more indicative of you sitting because it takes three movements yeah. of you to get up, to get out. If you're standing, yeah. you're already ready to run. You and they're thought, not actually part of the equation. Of, you of thought fire. my pyromancy story was just a story, <laughs> but right over here. <laughs> um, so, so just keep the door clear. We're good. Having having um, those conversations allows that character to not just be a disruptor to the party who's always lighting things on fire that everybody's like, God, d can we please just have a story without you lighting this kind old lady's dog on fire? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and uh, instead leads to you having actual character development and stories that are compelling and that you tell years later um, to, uh, to, to the, your uh, cousin's kids because you don't have them of your own if you're me. Uh, yes. Questions? Yeah. Well, actually, wait, we're going to get back. There's one guy over there in the back. Yeah. Had a question. Had a question. Sure. question. Uh, well, well, real quick, let me, let me first pause real quick. Before we get to questions, where are we at on time? We're at 30 minutes. 30 minutes? Yeah, okay. It is 1.35. Uh, we do not have to clear until, well, your panel's not until 2.30. My panel's not until 2.30. Uh, yeah. So this one would technically end at oh, 2, around 2.10, 2.15 is normally so when I mean and make you all leave the room. I didn't know what time we were at because this is my panel and I'm not even monitoring anything. But I, I have What's one more quick DM 101 tip and then we'll get to questions. Um, if you have questions about personal games, um, or how a very specific question on how to DM, I have great news. At 2.30, there's going to be a bunch of professional DMs from all different backgrounds up here, including Posh from Who's Roll, and Alex from Quid Pro Roll, and me and a couple other Goblins and Growlers peeps, and we'll be answering those questions in more detail. This is just my way of trying to con you into being here at 2.30 uh, while I have this platform I wasn't supposed to have. Uh, so I gave it to him, yeah. so it's my fault. <laughs> Throw it in another... Uh, Throw in another plug. I don't think they got the message. Yeah. Hey, do you, uh, hey, do you guys know about this thing? I don't if, know about it. If you were at my 2:30 panel on Thursday, and even if you weren't, five star it on the app. Uh, so, the what the heck is goblins and growlers? Yeah. Also, he's looking for patrons, specifically demonic ones. Oh man, if you guys, if you know any, I've got, I've got a couple lawyers cards already from this weekend, which I'm really excited about. Um, I actually am excited about. We, we need a lawyer. Uh, Game-specific lawyer, preferably. Uh, so we, uh, not because we're in trouble, I should also make that, it was just because taxes are hard. If I don't like reading books, taxes are just a whole other nightmare. Um, so the, uh, if, you're, if you're a DM, so we've talked a bit about story creation, how to have that conversation in your session zero, how to set the standards for um, not only what you want to do for your character, but also how the DM wants to run their game, and making sure that that aligns with the adventure that you're, you're having because you want to have fun both as a player and also you should have fun as a DM. It should never feel like work. If it feels like work, get, get a player to do that part of it. Uh, and, uh, and then we've also talked about um, creating inclusive spaces, uh, making sure that it, it doesn't, you know, a, a lot of times that's just having the open conversation and also making sure that you're um, open to m more players. But that also means kicking players out. So here's another quick, uh, we're, this will be one that we'll talk about at 2.30 for sure, because I've kicked my brother out of a campaign, so that's a fun story. Breaking uh, up with your players is an actual life skill. But, but this is important. You, it's an inclusive storytelling game. I, people come up to me all the time. They say, this is an amazing adventure you wrote or run me through or that, that you did for your podcast. How did you write it? And I'm like, in very broad strokes and then nothing else and everything was written by my players. It sounds amazing because I talk really fast and I have an improv background so people think that I'm doing things really well. Uh, but that's just literally 16 years of experience. Uh, if you as a as a uh, DM don't have that 16 years of experience, sometimes you're not gonna think as fast on your feet and it's gonna feel a little herky-jerky. Please don't worry about that. I was a really bad DM when I started. I was really bad. 
a lot of times people would be like, I want to do this. And I'd be like, I'm going to throw rocks at you while I think about what I'm supposed to do instead. Uh, it's, oh. it's, it's not a problem. And it's also OK to tell your players, hey, give me a moment. I need to figure out. I was not expecting you to light old woman's dog on fire. I, believe it or not, I didn't write a contingency plan. Give me a moment to figure out how she would deal with this, how this dog would deal with this, if this is like a Zelda chicken situation. <laughs> I, need to, I need to determine those, this. Those chickens, man. But, but um, you as a, since it's a collaborative storytelling environment, you don't have to write the entire thing. Um, everyone will always say, if you want to do that, you write a book. I don't like words, so I don't. I write a very general outline, and then my players will provide a lot of the content for me. I create open spaces for them to, to do that. Um, because it is inclusive storytelling, you have to put the spotlight on all of your players at various times. And, in, and it's, it's, as a DM, one, super fun because you don't have to do all the work. It's really nice to not have to do all that work all the time. Two, it creates a more dynamic, amazing game. It will be stories you would never have come up with yourself and will always be better the more voices that you have in it. But three, and most importantly, when you have a player who's like, oh, I see the spotlight's on him, but it's my time to monologue. And they put on their half mask and, uh, and they uh, talk about their fire daddy. Uh, and, uh, spotlight cue. Spotlight. Uh, and, then, and then you're like, okay, yeah, that was cool. But now for, oh, oh back to you, I guess. Uh, the, the people who are those people, here's my policy, here's my rule. If you, if you one, are stealing the spotlight from other people, two, are making people uncomfortable by doing things like trying to seduce everyone, uh, happens don't do that uh or three well wait wait in lesson session zero you've talked about it and everyone says yes that we, sounds hilarious let's do that I, th I think we should definitely lightly go over in lines and veils yeah well zero. i was gonna say and i'm gonna stop i'm gonna i'll talk about that in a second and then three um there is uh there is the type of player who just i, I think right when everyone's having fun is like I'm, I'm going to create chaos and make us all mass murderers in this one instance when we were about to be heroes, just to, because it's fun. Murder uh, hobos. Again, it's fine if you talked about it in session zero, but if you're just busting it out and it's making your other players uncomfortable or not having fun, here's my policy. You take them aside. You talk to them. You say, hey, uh, my brother's name is Russell, so I'm not going to use that example. Hey, uh, Tussle, you... <laughs> I get that your character is really cool. I, I do. Everyone else has really cool characters. We can't just focus on your character all the time. I'm going to need you to make sure that we share that spotlight because the collective storytelling is, is what makes D&D uh, more fun than a video game and more fun than a, a, a novel. I'm biased because I can't read. And, and so um, I'm, I'm going to need you to take that step back. And if Tussle says, uh, yes, absolutely, I'm going to take that step back, then you're like, awesome, we're going to keep playing. If it keeps happening, you're like, hey, hey man, I know you're totally not my brother, but I'm going, I'm, going to have to, I'm going to have to let you leave this game. Because you can do anything in RPGs and D&D until it interrupts the fun of others. That's my big rule. People ask me, hey, uh, should I allow this person to, who wants to play my game to be uh, uh, all robot, even though it's a high fantasy world. I'm like, if he has a good story and it doesn't interrupt the fun of others, yes. And they're like, hey, look, this person wants to be, <laughs> what is the character's name? Mick Rib, a skeleton who's been uh, reanimated and who uses his own ribs as his weapons. And I'm like, look, as long as it doesn't interrupt other people's fun and he's fine with role playing the fact that everyone was terrified of him uh, and or very hungry when they see him. Uh, then yes, please do it. Uh, was he odorous? Did he just smell like a big rib? No, uh, no. He tried to do prestidigitation every now and again, but he kept rolling low, so it kept being really bad. So uh, it was it was horrible. Uh, but uh, the my my overarching thing, if there's nothing else you take away from this panel, is people who are DMs or prospective DMs. If you are having fun and everyone at your table is having fun, okay. If it starts to interrupt somebody else's fun, even if it's just one person. Not okay. And there's some really great techniques for how you can do this, um, which uh, would you like to talk, yeah. you, you brought one up. So yeah. these are some really cool techniques that um, have been developed over the last 
uh, five years yeah, by DMs, five. yeah, by DMs to to uh, kind of integrate into your games to make them very streamlined. If and, and figure out in case you're playing like with me, I play with randos all the time. I say randos is a love uh, statement because I love playing with new people. Um, and but I don't know a lot about their backgrounds or them or even their names necessarily. I remember their character names a lot more. Uh, uh, but there, there could have a really, like I have one person, he is an architect, he has nightmares, this is real, this is a real person, he has nightmares all the time about bridges falling because he works on bridges. He hates bridges, uh, but he loves them, but he just has a fear of them uh, because of his work. And I think some tra tra trauma in the past that he, uh, he didn't share with me, and that's okay, he doesn't have to. Um, but when we came to a bridge in my game, he was very uncomfortable. I could not put together this rando was scared of bridges. I thought he was uncomfortable because of the brigands or something. But uh, we, there's a lot of systems for him to showcase that he's uncomfortable, and we're going to talk about them right now. Yeah, so in the last five years, it's kind of surprising how recent these, these things have come up. There, there's a couple things you can do in session zero to really flush out um, your gameplay. And one of those is lines versus veils. So a line is something that you literally draw in the sand. Um, it's something that that player does not want in the game at all. Um, good examples of this is child uh, romance. Uh, another example of a great line is just sex in general. Some people just don't want that. Um, it also can be in the other category, which I'll go over in a little bit. Uh, other things are one of my players uh, really had a lot of problem with body horror um, and did not want to play out any type of uh, mm -hmm. decapitation or, or sawing of arms and stuff some like other that. ones that might be uh, less uh, less rational like I have a my line is clowns yeah there, I, do that's not, I really don't like clowns a lot uh, I really don't like them that's why Alex will I know put it into our quid pro roll podcast because that's for the people and they'll be entertained by my reaction to that but that is a line that usually I draw very firmly if I'm DMing or playing uh, and, and like I said, my, my mate, who I'm now closer with, his line is bridges. That's one that people wouldn't necessarily put together very easily, but it's good to have those communicated in your session zero. So in general, like, the one thing you want to make sure before you even do any of this is that you tell all players that everyone's feelings are valid and that this is a safe place, that we don't accept like, laughing at people's traumas. Like, and in general, like, if you feel that the group needs uh, more space than that, you can have them write down those lines. Um, so it's more anonymous, but in general, I haven't had. When, once I tell people, "Hey, we're going to talk about these things," like we're going to talk about lines, we're going to talk about veils. I also, uh, I also have a line for uh, mar marginalized communities, not marginalizing them further in games. Now I know that that can be very realistic and can be a really good thing to for for uh, possibly some people to understand from a better perspective on those marginalized communities. But me, I don't like to marginalize immigrants in my game because my family is an immigrant family. I have a very foreign name. It gets a little too close to home for me. Um, the yesterday, uh, I get why they did it, but there was a, a, a group uh, for whose role, and I talked to Posh about it. It's just, it was funny, and they didn't bring it up, which was great, but that the person hated furries. Now, I, I don't, I know a couple furries. Uh, I love furries. They're all the nicest people I've ever met. And here's my thing. They're ostracized people in an ostracized community, just like nerds are ostracized people in an ostracized community. So I hate like marginalizing them inside of the community. So those are like my few lines that I draw for my DM games. Um, then uh, if you establish those for session zero for long standing games, really awesome. Another thing that you can do is called the X card or X factor. Um, I like to call it X gonna give it to you. Uh, I think <laughs> some other panelists a couple years back talked about that and I was like, I'm doing that forever. Uh, the X gonna give it to you rule is really great. You guys should all internalize this because you don't have to have a session zero to do it. So if you're at a con, if you're at a brewery, if you're at wherever, uh, it's a good one to know, which is if something's making you uncomfortable or one of your players uncomfortable, they do a big, a big X or they have a card that they hold up. I know I just popped the mic by being too close. Um, but uh, they, they do a big X and then you understand in that moment that you're going to rewind the adventure as a DM uh, by about you know five minutes and then take a different route. Uh, if that means saying, hey, give me a second because I need more improv experience, uh, then it, it's, hey, give me a moment I need because I need to figure out how I'm going to go a different route. Um, but that way, this person, in this instance, doesn't have to describe or tell anything about why they've X'd. Usually you'll know. 
hasn't happened in any of my games, but from the stories I've heard, usually you're well aware of why they're Xing something. And then you just go, like, if it's giant spiders that came out of nowhere, just out of nowhere, and then somebody gives a big X, it's like, maybe they don't like the woods. No, they don't like the giant spiders you just introduced. No, it was definitely the woods. Yeah. Usually it's pretty quick. Thank you so much. You're the best. Usually it's pretty quick to figure out. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna guzzle this on microphone. Uh, usually it's pretty quick to figure out why why they've X something. It's really it's really an easy and awesome way for us to continue to build inclusive community. Now we're gonna open. I, we've got like 15 minutes, something like that. So we're gonna open things up to questions. Here's gonna what I'm gonna say for questions. One, I'm not gonna get through all of yours, but I am gonna go really quick. If you would like more in-depth questions, we have an entire panel that's gonna be dedicated to it at 2:30. It's my last plug for myself. Uh, and then the second thing is, if you have an item that is cool that you want to hold up, I know there's probably in case. It's not because uh, it's not because there's gonna be too many hands and I'm not gonna know who to call on. It's more because it's more fun for me. I'm just trying to create entertainment for me. Actually, I think the best thing to do is mine. Uh, because giving you guys the mic will allow for. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll repeat it really loud. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna rapid fire so we can try to hit as many as we can. We're gonna start in the back left corner. Yes. Okay. I'll repeat the question so everybody knows what they are. Fantastic. In that case, um, what would you do for a player that doesn't feel like they're actually getting a chance to get some type of spotlight? Like, what else is that What would you do for a player who is not getting enough, or feels like they're not getting enough spotlight time? Is your question. My answer? I would sit down with them one on one outside the game and, uh, and, and try to ask them what they want to do with their character and then try to create spaces in my game for them to do that. Um, right, uh, uh, st uh, the, the Star Wars pew pew and then we'll go to the one right behind it. Yeah. Um, yeah, you have some, uh, the, you have a friend who's a DM who I have a friend who's a DM who this crazy thing happens. It also happens in my game, but I'd rather put him on the spot. Um, that's what I do for my questions. Uh, so you, uh, they, they railroad the game. Um, or they take the game and they take it in their own way, even though he's written stuff and he wants to play that stuff. My advice is just to sit down with all of them and say, guys, please. And if they say no, be like, okay, I'm going to find a new group. That's honestly my answer. Right behind it. Oh, so oh. So lines are you don't talk about it at all. Veils, you can talk about it. Like think of a video game cutscene where like, oh, we're gonna have sexy time and then they cut away. Mm -hmm. That's a veil line. Okay. So yeah. Like yeah. Um, and so veils are your way to um, uh, make sure that things are implied without uh, going into the detail of uh, the the whatever. Um, you know, if somebody doesn't like yeah, if somebody doesn't like uh, body horror, you can be like, you come in. There is a very dead body. Uh, that is a veil for how maybe you wanted to describe that body. Uh, this tends to be a veil in my games, mm -hmm. just because like, people want to go yeah. to Perfect. We're going to go right here. Yes. Yeah, simplifying the rules for casual players or younger players. This one's actually like really close to home for me because I've done a lot of this trying to create inclusive community for especially LGBTQ youth. Um, my thing, one, there's a ton of resources out there. Um, if you start to, I, uh, if you come to my panel at 2.30, we'll talk more about this um, because I know this question always comes up. Um, the, the best way to do it, so there's some, there's some, one, there's some sheets that are there, actually some new ones that got created for dyslexia if you guys haven't seen them. So you can look up dyslexia character sheets. They're pictures. It's really awesome. For young players, it's also really effective. Um, and also for all sorts of things, not just for dyslexia. It's a really amazing sheet. So check that out. Um, number two, you can streamline the rules by, um, Honestly, the more dice you take out of it, the easier it is for younger people. Uh, so if, if that means like just trying to make everything a D6, D20 system, a lot of times that makes it a lot easier for it because then they don't have to fish for the dice and like, is this a D8 or a D10? I'm like, I don't even know and I've been playing for 16 years. Yeah. Uh, that one's something we'll go into more detail at 2.30, I know, but I'm going to just try to hit as many questions as possible right here with the picture of uh, the old lady whose dog got set on fire. Oh, God. Yeah. Yes. So how do you come up with like, stats for most uh, When you have your players who make very original characters, how do you actually stat them out? Usually, I try to find something that's really close to them, and I just kind of riff off that. Uh, if it's a completely new one, I've been DMing for so long that I can kind of like, somebody recent, last 
year I had a pop-up D&D game. I'm gonna have pop-up D&D games later, so if you guys wanna play D&D with some professional DMs, I think almost all of us are gonna have pop-up games after our 2.30 panel. Um, so you can have see this firsthand. Somebody came up to me, they said, I've never played D&D before. I was like, great, you're in the right place. They're like, I wanna play a giraffe that's a black belt in Taekwondo, and I was like. <laughs> I was like, I love it. I'm going to just create this on the spot. And you know what? If it, I need to, I always tell them if I need to nerf something, we'll nerf it. Uh, as in, as in, if something, if I build it too powerful, then we'll bring it down. If I build it too weak, we'll bring it up. But I usually just kind of do the policy of of open communication, like. As long as you're okay with me sometimes being like, yeah, you know what, Using, giving you reach because you use your neck to karate chop people uh, was, was a bad idea. Uh, so I'm gonna pull that back. Um, that's usually how I do it. I just try to find something close. We can go more in depth on that another time. More questions right here. You're holding a thing, uh, maybe a dice? Oh, the, the, perfect. Very on brand. Uh, if you are, okay, so for a group of players and a DM who are brand new, which uh, I know probably a lot of us in the room have run into and made tons of mistakes doing, uh, I know I did, uh, my biggest piece of advice, if you are really creative and you have this whole world and you want to throw them into it, just do it and learn by mistakes as you go along. If you're not and, and writing is a little bit daunting, uh, grab a module and again, just throw them into it and make mistakes and learn as you go along. That's probably my best piece of advice there. Um, the other thing is like, watch some YouTube videos or uh, listen to some podcasts, maybe even quid pro roll uh, and see how they're doing some things and steal. Steal from the people who've been doing it for a long time because usually they've found that by making those mistakes already. Uh, hat. New DM with more experienced players working through the, uh, the issue of, of, of trying to have that confidence because they're so much more experienced than you. Yes? Um, m one, uh, talk to them outside one-on-one -on -one and get them on your side. Be like, hey, you know I'm a new DM. You guys want to have this adventure. You, you need me. Uh, <laughs> So, so help me out. If there's times where I'm a little bit unconfident or if I don't know the rules or something, uh, please help me out. Don't just, uh, don't just uh, power game your way through what I'm trying to do. Having that conversation, usually uh, it results in, in, in good results. There's other ways, and we can get more to that in the 2.30 panel. I'm gonna say that a lot, but this is the quick answer. I'm trying to get as many questions as I can. Staff. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, uh, yeah. So uh, that that was a piece of advice rather than a question, which is a good piece of advice. Which is, uh, if you don't know how to do something, just be like, roll the dice. We'll see if that decides if I need to actually look this up and figure out some way to do something. Because if they roll low, then you're like, you shot that arrow at that other arrow, and they both deflected at you. Take two arrows of damage. <laughs> uh, Sometimes, sometimes it solves itself. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, right here, gray shirt. Oh my gosh, yes, please come talk to me after the panel. That's the best yeah, way that I can answer that. Yeah, uh, there's so much good stuff, but please talk to us. Session zero, it's amazing. So glad you're here, thank you. Uh, right here, Super Mario, 95, 80, 85? Numbers? Is it, here's my, is it interrupting the fun of other people at the table? If yes, take them aside, talk about, uh, hey, we would love for you to role play a little bit more or create a self-insert character so that you're role playing by being yourself. Um, if no, as long as it's not impeding other people's fun, then you know, you're all good. Uh, yes, right here across the aisle. Oh my God, yes. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna repeat this question. Uh, struggling balancing, ca balancing encounters both with difficulty and variety. This is a really long answer, so I'm gonna get to it on the 2.30 panel. If you don't mind coming to that, I'm gonna force you now. This is where I'm at. Because it's, it's a long answer. It's something I struggle with a lot, so I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, 
but, uh, but uh, the, the overarching large thing is there's a lot of ways to balance and there's a lot of really good DMs and resources on like YouTube and stuff to balance them, but ignore those, come and talk to us at 2.30. Uh, I have some unique solutions about, because we create monsters a lot because we're not actually Wizards of the Coast sanctioned, so we have to create our own monsters for a lot of our games uh, because we make money. So when I'm making, uh, I have this idea and I'm like a Chimera Turducken, uh, I have to figure out how to balance that for our Thanksgiving game, and uh, that's sometimes a nightmare. We figured out some good ways. Um, we'll talk about. Uh, back in the corner, arm sleeve. Uh, so it's actually a question for maybe both of you to answer. Yes. 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 Oh, good. That's no. That's one hundred percent. Oh, same. I, I want to escape this world too. Uh, no. Okay. So the quick uh, question. Make sure. Wait. You're gonna keep standing because you're gonna give me a thumbs up if I get the question right. Um, you had players who uh, would railroad the games intentionally into things that would make you, as the DM, uncomfortable. And your question is, how do I how do I address that? Yes. Right. Okay. No, you're all good. This is why we we do that. Yes. And they're not essentially railroading right. because people are nicer now. Yes. Um, but it's not where I would go. I'm very invested in it. How do I get over that so that I make sure they have fun? Okay. So, in, yeah. So, in, <laughs> so this is actually like a big thing because like with autism spectrum, I'm like control is my baby. Uh, so the way that I've kind of compromised with this is that I actually believe in beyond just session zero, what we call a nightcap. Uh, to each of your sessions. I really, rec I actually recommended this for a lot of the questions that have come up. If you can get your players at the end of the game to like tell you what their motivations are going into the next session, you can change your own control. You have now let them give, in, give you the crumbs that you need in order to build the next session towards your own goal while also incorporating theirs. This is the only type of metagaming I allow. Because one of the great things about role playing sessions is you can't read facial expressions in game you don't know that his character, the Goblin Slayer, has you know, no expression or he's being stoic about it or if he's joking. So one of the light, like, things I like to do at the end is a nightcap and be like, hey, what's your character want to do next time? Why, what do you care about? Do you care about the treasure or do you care about this? And then I incorporate those breadcrumbs into my next session so that I know that I have a little bit of the trigger control that I need as well as I'm allowing the players to tell other players, hey, this guy cares about the treasure, you don't and you want to stop him, and then they can go to the next session. A lot of these like contextual clues that we get from normal interactions, you won't get in a game session. So if you can get them to say it out loud, it really helps the role play in the next session, as well as your own uh, needs. I, I never do that, and every time it comes up, the, the nightcap, I'm always like, wow, what a great idea, I should always do that, and then I never do. Uh, but it's a really good idea. My quick answer to yours is gonna be uh, a very too real answer. Uh, if you're comfortable enough and confident enough, use it as a time for personal growth to try to let go of some of those control tendencies in the world of high fantasy so that then you're growing in the world of real place. Uh, I try to do that all the time actually nowadays, but that's also because I'm, I'm a lot more comfortable and confident than I used to be. A lot of times when you're a new DM, that's kind of like, oh, work on myself while I'm trying to escape from myself. What a uh, concept that I'm not gonna be able to do. Uh, that's. It's a much like, deeper conversation, but a lot of times, I mean, this is the reason why role-playing games is being used for therapy and stuff like that now. So my voice is starting to go, and I need to rehab it until 2.30, and then I need to run D&D games, so we're going to take a quick pause. But wait, before you leave, one, please give a thank you to, uh, I know I said staff earlier, but other staff uh, for being here and kind of making this. <laughs> Still, they saved the panel. They also put out a fire that somebody started. I don't know how that happened. Uh, it was not something I made somebody roll yep. for. Um, and then uh, second off, um, just as a, a quick thank you guys so much for, for wanting to DM, uh, for DMing, for creating these spaces. Uh, my name's Alon, I'm with Goblins and Growlers. 2.30 we're gonna have me, Posh from Who's Roll, Alex from Quid Pro Roll, 
other people from Roll, 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 uh, and we're we're gonna be uh, doing doing more of this as well as having pop-up games after the best. I, uh, we also will have one-page adventures. So if you're really getting like looking to get into D and D, we actually have these on our Patreon. And a lot of people pay money for them, but we entered one into a contest, so nobody can pay money for it anymore because it's public. Uh, it's now been public record, so we're giving it away for free. Uh, you can even scan it and sell it yourself. We would prefer you don't, but it's possible. And uh, my lawyer can't do anything about it that I don't have yet, but I have cards. Uh, so um, uh, please come to that, and, uh, and thank you guys so much for this. I have no cards or anything, but come up and say hi if you would like, and uh, see you guys later. Thank you. One last resource. Oh. Just one last resource. If you're more interested in Tango to the 230 panel, you're really interested in inclusivity, psychology, as well as one shot. Uh, sorry, one shot. There's legitimately a podcast done by One Shot Podcast Network called Session Zero. And it's, actually, it's so good. It's really, really good. And it's so done, good. It's, it's done by therapists. It's like legitimately therapists talking about mm -hmm. it. And they're going through school and they're like, you know, we're not going to like come at this like, as, like, so. Don't don't uh, don't rate this panel down on the on the app, but please rate my panels up. Uh, <laughs> have Magfest get more tabletop oh, here. Oh. If you really care about how well the payouts have gone this year, please come to the 2 p.m. leadership uh, seminar yes. on Sunday. On Sunday. Yeah. And then the Give other thing is, uh, thank you guys for tabletopping. Have a great mag. If I see you or don't, you guys are the best. Thank you. Thank you.